Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight. It's good to see you again, and it's really great that so many people are interested in Marshall South. Uh, Marshall South is one of my favorite desert characters, and I'm very, very happy to share what I know about him today. So I'm glad you could join us. Uh, a few logistics uh, before we start. There's a chat button. If you have questions after the presentation, uh, be sure and, and type in your questions and then I will be able to answer them. And I should mention that our speaker today is myself. Uh, one, and I, I get to be able to talk about one of my, like I said, one of my favorite characters and to tell you how I got involved with Marshall South. As a uh, way of an introduction, uh, let me first of all show you the uh, Ghost Mountain Chronicles. This is the book that is associated with the talk today and it will be on uh, with a special price. So if you're interested in getting this book, you know, be sure and check our website, be sure or call Sunbelt Publications to take uh, advantage of the discount we have in it. And also a freebie with this book when you order will be Marshall South Rides Again, which are two of his novels. So that's kind of a special deal that we can offer uh, to all of you. This meeting is being recorded. And if you should miss part of it, if you know someone who is interested in Marshall South, check back in a couple of days on our Facebook page and you will find a link to our YouTube site uh, for Sunbelt Publications where you'll find not only this presentation, but you'll find all of our presentations there. So if you're interested in any of our books and would like to hear our authors talking about their books, be sure and check out our YouTube page. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, be able to uh, start this with you. So I'm going to go to screen share here and we'll get this program moving along. So Marshall South and the Gross Mountain Chronicles. Um, what, what this book does, this Ghost Mountain Chronicles book, is to tell the, the story of Marshall South, which had not been fully known before I was able to start researching it. And so let me give you a, a little bit of background how I got involved in this. I did my master's degree at San Diego State University and I wrote it on the history of Anza Borrego Desert State Park. At the time, I was curious about Marshall South. There was not much known about him, but I had heard that his wife, Tanya South, was living in La Mesa. I found her address. I went to her door. I knocked on the door and, and asked if I could talk to her and learn a little bit about the, the, uh, the life that they had up on Ghost Mountain. Uh, she slammed the door in my face after she had opened it briefly and said, go away, leave me alone. I never want to see you again. And that was the extent of the interview with Tanya South. And so it was almost 25 years later that I had heard that Tanya passed away at almost 100 years old. And I gave a call to Ryder South, who was the oldest son of Marshall and Tanya, and said, you know, are you willing to talk and tell me a little bit about what happened on Ghost Mountain? Uh, when I originally contacted him 25 years earlier after Tanya had slammed the door in my face, he said, my mother doesn't want me to say anything. So when I approached him later, he kind of looked at me curiously and said, yes, I will talk to you. And so I was preparing myself for this really great lecture. And instead, I got a binder, a binder of poetry and articles. And he said, here, this is everything you need. And, I, and then he left. And I thought, well, how am I going to find out about Marshall South with this binder? But I started flipping through it and had all this wonderful poetry that had been published in the Los Angeles Times. And every one of those articles was published again under a different name in the Oceanside newspaper. So I immediately contacted the historian of uh, the Oceanside Historical Society and asked her to look up those particular newspaper articles and to see if there were any comments on the editorial page. And in doing that, I discovered not only that Marshall had a different name, but he was doing other kinds of things during that time that those books, uh, those articles were being published. 
And that's so that started to get me on track on who Marshall was. Every time I learned something, I'd go back to Ryder and I said, did is for instance, Marshall always claimed that he was from England. He was born from England, that he had all this experience in England. Well, fake news, guys. Uh, he was really born in Australia. So it took a while to ferret that out. But every time I went to Ryder, I found something. I said, is this true? He nod his head. He says, you're getting warm. You're getting close. But he would never give me information. All I could do was to find out whether or not I was on the right track or not. So it proceeded for quite some time until I fully got the story. And at one point, I asked Ryder, I said, do I have the story? And he said, yes. And that's when we put together Marshall South and the Ghost Mountain Chronicles. So who was Marshall? So what we did know about him or, or had at that point was that he wrote a lot of articles for Desert Magazine for many, many years. And these articles came out uh, right after the, the, the Depression, uh, some years later, and they really captured people because in those days, there was really no social media like we have today and television where you could kind of find out what's happening. You know, you got your news from the radio, you got your news from magazines that you read. And so people really glommed onto Desert Magazine to read about this family that was experimenting in primitive living in ghost, on Ghost Mountain in Anzabrago State Park. And so this is, this is how he developed an audience within Ghost Mountain. So the Souths were basically kind of the original hippie family. They, they wanted to be outdoors. They wanted to be, do their own thing. They wanted to be self-sufficient. Uh, and they were also nudists. And so they kind of practiced this uh, out in the, in the middle of nowhere. And they, this is what they wanted to do. So um, who was South? Well, South, first of all, was a genius. He, he was uh, up in the Mensis category that, where we can put some folks that are unusually creative, unusually uh, smart at, at pretty much everything that they put their hands on learning about things. Um, he was also a fierce independent spirit. He wanted to do his own thing. He didn't want anybody telling him what to do. He was not interested in money. He was interested in spiritual pursuits. He was a, a conservationist, a naturalist, and probably one of the first two uh, of those early writers that spoke out about nature and desert, you know, trying to make sure that nature can be preserved in its, in its state. And so what, what I found out about him as, as I continued to research that he was quite productive as a talented person. He had numerous articles that he had written, lots of poetry, um, at one point in time, he had, he uh, vied against uh, Alfred Noyes, who wrote The Highwaymen, and he was considered to uh, become maybe the poet laureate of the United States. But one of the things about Marshall, no matter what he got his hands into and, and really did, once he got to a point that people praised him and wanted to read more or see more of what he was doing, that's when he quit. He quit because he said at that point, I had achieved what I wanted to achieve. And if I had continued, then it would be a job. And he didn't want a J-O-B. He wanted to continually test himself, prove himself in different areas. So he would achieve a point, he would quit and go on to something else, which is a great frustration for Tanya because there was never a steady source of income for that family, except for Desert Magazine. And that was a job to him, which he moaned and groaned every time he had to do an article, but that was the only way that they could actually get income into the family. So where, where was Marshall South, the uh, Ghost Mountain area? It was in the middle of Anzabrago State Park. If, um, if you look over uh, where this arrow is, you'll see the name of what he called his home. It looks like Yakitapec, but it's Yakitapec. He pronounced it Yakitapec, uh, named after the Yaki Indians. And it was basically uh, the Yaki Hill. And so Yakitapec was the, the home for the Souths. Uh, South himself um, said it didn't really matter what, what nature habitat you really loved and enjoyed, whether it be the ocean, the mountains, the desert. But he said for him, it was the desert. The desert kind of captured him. And he said it was the type of place that you either hated or loved. And if you loved it, it would just draw you closer and closer, which, which it did for Marshall. 
He also talked about in the Desert Magazine articles, the appeal of the desert, why the desert was so wonderful, um, you know, why, how the Indians survived in there. But, you know, what is, one of the things that he said, which was common to early writers in those days that were interested in nature, that it was a place to escape from civilization. It was a place that, that you could just be, it was a turning home. And so this is how he kind of looked at the desert. He wrote about the charm of the desert. He saw the desert as, as kind of a tempestuous woman with a lot of different moods. And, you know, as you can see, um, if, if you do know the desert, you know, it can change from, you know, flash floods to beautiful sun to flowers to uh, in, in, in the fall and you know, at times when there's drought conditions, you know, it's dry as can be. So it's continually changing with weather patterns. And this is the thing that made him so much in love with it, that it was always a changing view of the desert. And he also talked about the smell of the desert, especially the when it rained. When it rained, the creosote smell just engulfed the whole area. And it's the, it's the smell of the desert in the rain. And so he talked about that also. If you go hiking to Ghost Mountain, you will, you will see these ruins. And you will kind of wonder how in the heck did people survive in a place like this? No water, up on a dry hill, and yet this is what they did. So the question is, why was this story lost in time? Well, part of it is that nobody really knew his background. He kind of hid his background. He always said he was from England. Um, nobody really knew all of the things he had done because when he quit doing something, he turned his attention to something else. And then there was this divorce that happened after 18 or so years on Ghost Mountain. And it was, it was, not, a, it was not a nice divorce. And we'll talk about why that was. And, you know, and it's so, it kind of fueled, fueled the rumor mills as to what, what happened up there and people wanted to know. And, you know, part of that was Ryder South uh, being able to uh, pull information out of him and confirm some of the facts that I was able to ferret out as I continued to do research on the South family. So the story of South is, is from the man to the myth that he had created about himself to the reality of, of who he was. One of the first things that I did discover was Marshall South was not his real name. It was a pseudonym. It was a name he wrote under. He was actually from Australia, never had been to England. Um, he was from South Adelaide and his family actually um, had a station. They called them stations instead of ranches uh, where there was sheep. And these are his parents here. And he really liked uh, Blair Valley, where Yakutapec was located, because it reminded him of this station, which was kind of barren with a few trees that were in there, and it was very much a returning to home to live in the Blair Valley area. He was a, it was a man that was extremely talented from an early age. He got a job as a teenager working for a newspaper doing sketches. He was fascinated by the United States, would write about oh, Americans were you know, just into money and they, and they were not concerned about what was happening in the world as, as World War I was coming into play. And he, he was always talking about the dangers of China as far as Australia is concerned and that, you know, the countries needed to be prepared. He was fascinated with the American West and perhaps what the reason he picked the name Marshall South was that he just kind of envisioned himself as a, as a, uh, as a marshal of, uh, of the West, kind of uh, bringing in the stories and, and telling stories of the West and maybe South or South Adelaide. Don't really know, but those are kind of guesses as to why he may have picked that name. But he wrote all kinds of commentary, uh, political commentaries, essays, uh, all kinds of stories. And then his mother gathered up the two boys that she had and decided to leave his father. And they came to the United States, settled in Oceanside. And there he, be, he became uh, known locally because uh, he got involved in everything. He started a, um, a militia because he was so concerned about how World War I was, was going to come and nobody was paying attention and they needed to be prepared. He organized debate clubs. He started the American Defense League. In fact, he got so involved in the American Defense League and it became a national 
organization. They asked him to be a head of the national organization, but true to form, he when he got to that point where they wanted him to lead the group, he quit. And that was the end of the of the Defense League. And he was, you know, continued to be involved with uh, with guns. He, he was concerned about the defense of his country. He even met with Theodore Roosevelt in San Diego and suggested that San Diego be developed as a military base in preparation for World War I. So he, he was very involved in that kind of thing. Um, his mother was concerned about him going to war, so he joined the military as a civilian. He went to uh, Camp Henry Jones and uh, the quarter, joined the Quartermaster Corps, where he met Margaret. And there he fell in love with Margaret, who worked in the same office, and they married and they had a child. Um, and Margaret was a very practical woman, and she noted that Marshall was not the kind of person that was going to stick to a job and provide for the family. So she threw him out. He was heartbroken. He came back to Oceanside, um, started to become a carpenter, worked at the uh, Rosicrucian Fellowship where they were building a temple. And there he met Tanya. Uh, Tanya had come with her family from uh, Russia. Uh, they were Orthodox Jews. Um, she kind of fell away from her uh, family's religious beliefs and uh, went to uh, school in, in New York area, well, worked in Wall Street, and then discovered the Rosicrucian Fellowship and became so involved in it, she moved to Oceanside and became part of that uh, organization. And there at the Rosicrucian Fellowship, she met uh, Ta uh, Marshall, who was in desperate need of counseling because he was heartbroken that Margaret wouldn't take him back and that Margaret was so material oriented. In Tanya, he found a woman that could care less about material things, that was only cared about spiritual things. And so they were kindred spirits. He asked Margaret for a divorce and he married Tanya. But Tanya should have known what was her future when she, well, when she took a look at their honeymoon cabin, which uh, basically became their home and another cabin up on uh, north of Oceanside, which where today is uh, Camp Pendleton, and they were living in a very primitive condition. They were living in the nude, except for when they went out and uh, worked during the day, and she should have known what her life would have been. As you can see, they're a very handsome couple. Uh, he continued to write uh, to bring some income in. She worked as a secretary, and when they were free in the weekends, they got their Model T, and they went out and explored the desert areas, which they loved and discovered uh, this mountain, which they named Ghost Mountain and began to take hikes up there. And they found this as a perfect place where they wanted to settle, a mountaintop that was isolated where they could practice their, uh, their way of life and, and be closer to God. And this is what they wanted to do. Now they were able to do this in, in this day and age because there were certain conditions that allowed them to do this. One is the fact is that the Homestead Act was uh, still made land available so they could homestead on that area. Uh, the depression allowed them to break with normal things that people did in society and to experiment and do things that were different. Uh, there was also a movement in Germany in the late 1800s that uh, continued into the 1900s, which was a return to nature and nudism. And there was a lot of groups that kind of got involved with that kind of thing. Uh, they wanted to, uh, also to create their own world, a better world than, than what they saw around them. And they were very resourceful, smart people that wanted to take advantage of that situation. They were not the only ones to do this. So they're not really special and unique in themselves because part of this movement that came out of Germany, uh, this naturalistic movement, you know, was found in other areas such as in the Palm Springs area. There in Palm Springs, there was William Peter Pester. And uh, Pester was, uh, lived in the Palm Canyons, the Indian Canyons, and he was known uh, for his uh, lifestyle. And in fact, um, Nat King Cole even wrote a song about him. Some of you might be familiar with it. It was called Nature Boy. 
Um, the lyrics are really kind of cool. They are, there was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy. They say he wandered very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. And then one day, a magic day, he passed my way. And while he spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. So, so Pester was very much like uh, this experiment that was on Ghost Mountain, but Pester also was out of step. He happened to have been uh, a gay young man, and because he had followers, some other young men that were kind of following him, uh, society went against him and threw him in jail, and he ended up in um, Folsom State Prison's, uh, Prison and spent most of his life there because of his, of his beliefs. Uh, you, interestingly enough, he discovered um, Marshall South through Desert Magazines, which he read in prison, and he became pen pals. And so, so there were others like Marshall that wasn't unique, uh, this living out in the wilderness and, and trying to have your own lifestyle. Um, an interesting thing to share is what, what Pester wrote about himself, which aptly refers to what the kind of state and mental state that Marshall was in. Man was intended to live in a state of nature. All men's troubles, sickness, anxieties, discontent comes from a departure from nature. I would advise you to go back to nature. If you want to be cured, give up your extravagant habits, your high priced hotel life. Quit taking medicine and discharge your doctor. I have little use for money and I'm not bothered by politics and religion as I have no special creed. So this was very much in line with, with Marshall. So Marshall and Tanya, they decided to uh, build this house on top of this waterless mountain, which meant they had to carry up water uh, and just started to build their home. And it was uh, several years later that Tanya started to become restless. And you know, even though it sounded like a great idea to live out in the wilderness and and it, after several years of doing that with the uh, cold and heat and not many conveniences, she had pretty much had enough. And, and she wanted all along to have children, but Marshall did not want to have children because he had had such, he was so sad that he had been separated from his son when, um, when Margaret th had thrown him out. And he could see he was going to lose Tanya. So he agreed to have children. And so three children, followed. There was Ryder, there was Rudyard, and there was Victoria. All this did was to postpone the inevitable because eventually Tanya would, could not handle this isolation that they lived in, which Marshall really thrived in. And so how was it that he was able to support his family? Well, he continued to, to write magazines. He continued to write uh, books. He wrote a whole series of, of Westerns and adventure novels that were published in England. And in fact, he got so much praise from these novels. Ah, guess what? He quit being a novelist and he told Tanya, I'm not going to be a novelist anymore. Huge fight because that was a good source of income, but he did not want to do it because then it would be a J-O-B and he did not want that. But then in, in the uh, late 1930s, he sent an article into the Saturday Evening Post. And there, for the first time, uh, the, the world discovered Marshall South. He had not started writing for Desert Magazine yet. No one knew of his experiment in primitive living. And he had these young children, the two boys at that time. And he started to write about how they were able to survive and live out there. And then he sent uh, a query letter to Randall Henderson asking if he might be interested in articles also. Uh, Randall had told him that they couldn't pay as much as the Saturday Evening Post, but they would pay a penny a word if he wanted to write articles that would be of interest to his readers. So he tried a one month experiment on this experiment in, in primitive living that he did for one year. People loved it, all of this praise came in and it eventually became a column that lasted for, for nine years, every single month. And he got quite a following. Uh, the house, meanwhile, continued to expand. They had a bedroom area, a front room area. They had a mouse-proof room. And you can see an adobe wall that's over on the side here. This is, these were plans to expand it, uh, but you know, with the divorce and all, it never, it never happened. And so they had quite, quite a, 
a home here. Uh, they would bring in a juniper tree for Christmas. They had a, a stove, an adobe home. And you could ask yourself, well, how can you make adobe on a dry mountaintop? Well, they did have clay up there, and it was the clay that they processed to make pottery later on, but it was the clay they also used in the adobe home. And the water, they used urine. So they would save their urine, mix it with the clay, and make the adobe to, uh, to complete this house. They had lots of presents for the kids because the children... Uh, or the, the readers at Desert Magazine would send them uh, all kinds of toys and they would divvy out the toys that would last for like a couple of weeks at Christmas time. So the kids had lots of toys. They were homeschooled with the Julian School District and you know they continued to, to live at this uh, home on Ghost Mountain. They would have guests every once in a while. People would write and say if they could uh, come and visit. And, and if they had guests, they would put their clothes on and receive their guests. But if they didn't want to have guests, they would tell them we're strict nudists and we don't put clothes on. So if you want to come visit us, you'll have to leave your clothes at the bottom of the trail before you come up. So that kind of helped to control the amount of visitation. This was uh, Marshall's study area. He had a, um, a Ramada... Uh, top on the top of it. And so this was his office where he wrote his articles uh, once a month for Desert Magazine. And they were very self-sufficient. They uh, would use fiber that they collected or materials that they would um, purchase in the stores to um, make uh, baskets, to make shoes, to make things that they needed. Um, Marshall would write uh, read as much as he could about the early Indians that were in the area, which were the Kumeyaay, to find out how they processed foods. He had a, 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 um, a regular uh, communication with the M Missouri Botanical Garden, and he would write back and forth things he would share with them. He became friends with Kraft from Kraft Cheese Company, who wanted to have samples of his cacti, and in turn, Kraft would send him uh, boxes of cheese for the family. So he had a quite, quite a following. Uh, he, he experimented with actually grinding uh, uh, grains in the rocks like the Indians did, but he found that didn't work too well because there were a lot of sand that would end up, and he ended up using a coffee grinder to, uh, to gr uh, grind his grains. The grains, by the way, came from the feed store because it was cheaper than going to the grocery store. And so they would, we, they would buy oats and wheat in the feed store and then process them for the foods that they would eat. Um, constantly writing, experimenting uh, articles about it and um, making pottery that uh, in Julian, which uh, people were interested in until he got so much pottery and it was, and it was in such demand that he quit making pottery. Um, he was always drawing, always trying to introduce the kids to uh, nature. Um, when he went out there, he had his gun with him. He would, he would shoot rabbits and, and killed a couple of rattlesnakes that were around the house. But he found when he killed the rattlesnakes that uh, there were rodents. And he learned that to keep things in balance, not to kill things that were around there. And he eventually hung up his gun and just wanted to be a total peaceful person, live in uh, harmony with nature. Um, he also built a printing press. And he had people that uh, wanted to be part of uh, his um, community, and, and uh, they would um, sign up to be this. So there was some extra income from his uh, little printing press and articles that he sent out. He designed, uh, um, well, he had linoleum and made block prints out of them, carved into the linoleum and, and, uh, and made prints that he sold. Uh, continued to do uh, poetry on some of the print blocks that he made, uh, a variety of different things, as you can see here, beautiful paintings. Um, he would paint nature, and of course, there was demand for his artwork until there was so much demand that he quit doing uh, formal artwork that he sold for sale. This was a rendition of his house on Ghost Mountain, uh, Akatiu out in the Badlands. I did, he had portraits of the uh, family. There's Tanya over there with uh, um, Ryder and then Ryder over on the uh, rock. And he um, continued to, like I said, continued to do port, um, port pottery until, until there was so much demand that he didn't, he quit selling it and quit making it. Would find, he would collect things that he would find and make artwork out of that. Made a lot of jewelry. 
He had collected turquoise uh, when he had lived uh, in Arizona in, um, when he was in the Quartermaster Corps. He had saved it. He melted down quarters, silver quarters, and used that for the silver for his jewelry. So he sold jewelry for a while also. Uh, also did sculptures and made all kinds of really intricate, neat things. He wrote children's stories. Uh, he sent these to publishers in New York, but at that time there was not the interest in uh, Indian stories. When he had sent them in, it kind of had phased out. And so uh, these were never published. So he has a lot of, a lot of unpublished um, manuscripts and children's stories that are, that are still, still out there waiting for, for somebody to do something with them. Uh, the um, two of his uh, books actually deal with the Anza Borrego area because he liked to take the stories that he knew about or heard about and incorporate them into his books. And so the book, The Marshall South Rides Again, actually contains the uh, Robbery Range, which is about the uh, Southern Overland um, uh, Butterfield stage. Uh, time period, a really cool story. And then the flame of Terrible Valley and Terrible Valley being Earthquake Valley. And so they're, they're very fun stories. Uh, South, um, uh, as a Western writer, was, was uh, listed up there as part of the, could have been another Zane Gray or even may have passed Zane Gray in his ability to write uh, fiction that he did, but he didn't want to do that. You know, after getting, after writing those eight novels and getting so much praise, it was time to quit and go on to something else. He had lots of visitors that, you know, that he wanted to see. And he, as I mentioned, he would put clothes on, invite them to the top. If he didn't want them, you know, he would say, you know, leave your clothes at the bottom. He even had a couple of visitors that were happy to leave clothes at the bottom. There was a a nudist dancer, um, an exotic dancer that came up and became a friend of the family. And she was very happy to leave her clothes at the bottom and actually became quite close to the family. Uh, and so that was kind of a fun thing. He had one very surprising visitor and it was Marshall South Jr. He had lost contact with his son. His son was an engineer working in Long Beach uh, for an aeronautical firm firm and somebody had one of his friends had a subscription to desert magazine and saw the name marshall south took a copy of the magazine to marshall jr and said hey this man's got a name just like you is are you guys related and lo and behold marshall south jr wrote the publisher got a hold of marshall and they had this wonderful wonderful reunion and marshall was so happy to have contact with his son again um, that was about as far as it went because Tanya became extremely jealous and unhappy that a first wife uh, son appeared on the scene because she wanted to say that she was the only woman that Marshall ever married and she was kind of upset with it. And then also Marshall, uh, Jun Marshall South Jr.'s family were very religious, they were Christians, and they, they took a look at Tanya with her uh, palm reading and her, uh, the, her belief system in the Rosicrucians and uh, some of the other things that she was doing that was kind of uh, uh, more spiritualist. And they, they were very concerned about Marshall being heavily influenced by her. And Tanya wanted them to have nothing to do with Marshall. So there was, there was, a, it was unfortunate that Marshall never ever was able to develop uh, a visit with the son after that first visit. I had hoped to interview Marshall Jr. and I had made arrangements to see him in a January and that Christmas just before we were to meet and I was to get his side of the story. Um, he was, had been cold, so he went into the kitchen, he put the stove on, uh, the oven on, and dropped the door down and just sat on the edge of the oven door, had a polyester short shirt that caught on fire, and he was burned to death. Very, very, very sad and um, was, was not able to ever, ever interview him. So that's, that's what happened to Marshall Jr. So, so the family continued to grow. Uh, Victoria was born. And basically that was the beginning of the end because Tanya took a look at having a little daughter living in isolation with two boys and became very distraught over that situation. 
Uh, in the meantime, the water situation was not good on Ghost Mountain. It was uh, drought was starting to occur in that early time. And people advised him, go to Utah. There was nice places in Utah where he could be isolated. Plus there were people there that, you know, the kids could go to school, Tanya would be happy. And so they moved. They moved to Utah, stayed there a year. Marshall was miserable. He was miserable because he didn't have the isolation that he really wanted. And so he picked up the family, moved back to Yakutapec, and lo and behold, the Navy closed Yakutapec because they were using the uh, Carrizo bombing area as a bombing for a bombing range, and it flew right over Yakutapec, and they couldn't stay there. Uh, neighbors provided them a cabin up in the Laguna Mountains, though, and they stayed there for a year until the Navy allowed them to move back. But by that time, things had changed so much. Uh, they were older. It was harder to carry water up the hill. Uh, it was just very, very difficult. And Tanya was miserable. She was absolutely miserable. You can see how miserable she looks in this picture. I had asked Ryder about it. And Ryder said, well, there was a reason she was so miserable in that picture. She had just been to the dentist and they pulled out a whole bunch of teeth and she was in pain. And plus she was miserable. Uh, and really was very unhappy uh, being on Yakutapec. She was more, I felt more isolated than um, Marshall, who was able to go out once a month, get supplies, you know, turn his article in, visit with people in Julian. And Tanya and the children would only visit town maybe twice a year. And it was quite a production to clean themselves up so that they could go visit in town. So what are the factors leading to divorce? Uh, basically, there was no security, financial security for, for Tanya. She was concerned about the children, emergency medical services. They were getting older. It was harder to live up there. Uh, it was harder and harder to carry things up the hill. And that she didn't feel like she was being supported by Marshall. She felt extremely lonely. She was depressed. Um, and she was almost paranoid. She was, you know, she was a mess by then, and she really needed out. And so, you know, the, the only way she could get out, because in those days, you couldn't just get a divorce because you were incompatible. You had to have a divorce with a cause. And the very sad thing about this was that they told Ryder that he'd have to say that his father beat his mother, which he never did. And it was, it was, a, it was a lie. But, they, but he had to say that in order for the divorce to be granted and for the D Department of Welfare to provide housing and money for Tanya to move into town. So it was a very sad thing. Ryder always felt bad about it. And Marshall said it was okay because he understood that, that Tanya needed to get out because she was so mentally unstable at that point. And so, you know, Tanya moved to Point Loma. She, she got set up by the welfare department. In fact, she, she bounced back and eventually became an employee of the welfare department and worked there until she retired. The kids went to school at Point Loma, um, had, had uh, both Ryder and Rudyard had a little bit of hard time adjusting. Uh, Victoria had no problem because she started kindergarten with her own age group. Um, the children were very successful. Rudyard became a professor at San Diego State, uh, a, a writer became a, um, worked as a mechanic at North Island until he retired and little Victoria became a software engineer. So they, they survived quite well and, and, and went on to have very productive lives. Marshall, when he left, um, when Tanya left, he was in good health. In fact, when they moved up there, he had had a heart condition but that lifestyle and the food that they ate him made, made him very healthy. When he moved to Julian after the divorce, he deteriorated very rapidly. The heart condition came back. And after a couple of years, he passed away in, in Julian. So, um, you know, so there's, there was all these rumors as a result of this divorce. And people started to question, you know, about Marshall. Did he really write the articles? Were they based on reality? Did he really believe the things he wrote about? Did he, did he abuse the family? And, and then there was these rumors. Was there an affair with the librarian in, in Julian, Myrtle Botts? So this is Myrtle Botts. She was the, uh, the librarian in Julian. If you've been to Julian, you've seen the Chamber of Commerce uh, building. Um, 
it is it if you go inside you will see a mural that is there that Marshall had painted and that used to be the old library in Julian so Myrtle Botts was an interesting woman she was a woman like Marshall South that that people didn't necessarily uh, like because there were a lot of rumors um, about her in, in her case she was a very strong woman. She was very intelligent. She wanted to take over everything. Um, she, she took over the librarian from her daughter. Her daughter actually was the first librarian, but she took over the job from her daughter. Uh, she claimed to have founded the Wildflower Show, but it was, claim, but it was founded by other people. She claimed to have been the, the historian for Julian, but she took other people's works and just republished them as uh, the history of Julian. Uh, she was very, very active, and Julian is a very, cons at least in those days, was a very conservative community. It was founded by uh, Confederate soldiers that had come to uh, Julian. The, the women uh, supported the men, but they supported them as, as wives and mothers, and um, in that way, they didn't take over like, like, uh, like Myrtle did, and so People were, were not happy with Myrtle and they were very happy to spread any kind of rumors to discredit her in any way. Interesting thing is that if you go to Julian, not many people know about Myrtle Botts. Uh, her photos were, after she passed away, photos were removed, Chamber of Commerce. There's, there's really nothing that you can find out about Myrtle um, in, in the days that after her passing as people just were happy to see her go. Um, and so what about the Botts family? So the Botts family had supported Mar the Souths uh, from the very beginning. When, when Tanya and Marshall first started exploring Ghost Mountain, the Bottses had a restaurant in Julian called the Cozy Restaurant. And they would stop there and have something to eat before they would go explore Ghost Mountain. And through the years, they were always visiting with the Bottses. Um, the the Bottses, um, uh, became close friends with the Souths and eventually supported Marshall when he uh, went through the divorce, trying to uh, help him find jobs, odd jobs in, in Julian. And then when he was dying, they took him in and nursed him until he died and he died in their home. And then they later raised the money to uh, arrange for his burial and uh, and service that they had for him. So they were they were good friends of of the South. So so um, the the thing I need to kind of tell you now is that after I did all of this research and and discovered all this in the and the book Marshall South and the Ghost Mountain Chronicles came out. Um, we decided to raise money to create a film, which you can see at the Visitor Center. If you go to the Visitor Center to Anson Borrego, you will see this 15-minute film uh, about the South family, which you know I would encourage you to see if you haven't seen it before. Um, so the, um, the, the director of this, the photographer that, that actually created um, this uh, experiment in primitive living, went on to do another version and this is where he and I parted company. We I worked closely with him on the text uh, of of that, and the, the I was interviewed originally when I first started, and I didn't really know too much about the South family. And so afterwards, I asked him, "Would you redo the interview so I can kind of put my put the information that I knew uh, afterwards about the family?" And he never did. So what what he did was he decided that it would be more interesting if, if he went ahead and created a, an ending that wasn't really provable. It was, it was just what he thought would be a much more interesting uh, direction. And so what he did was to really blow up the, the relationship with Myrtle Botts without giving any background to the, to the relationship with that family. So fake news, uh, you might say so. Um, and it actually did a real disservice because I think if people, if he had just kept to the truth about, you know, there's all this mystery involved with, with South, I think people would be still very interested in what about uh, some of the things that Marshall did and, and who Myrtle Botts was. But, but he, he decided to end it with this affair that broke up the, the family, which uh, is, is not really totally true. 
So in talking to Jerry, who was Myrtle's daughter, uh, about this, you know, she said, you know, first of all, he said, he, she said, my dad was the most jealous man. He would, he would have killed Marshall if he'd looked cross-eyed at, uh, at, at uh, Myrtle, and he was very much in love with Myrtle. And, he, you know, as he said, my dad never worried about Marshall because there was nothing to worry about. And the whole family kind of treated him like a little child, and they were tickled because he wrote poetry and love letters to all the women in the family, and that included Jerry and Myrtle, Myrtle's mother and Myrtle's grandmother, who all lived in the house. So, you know, taking those love letters, putting them aside, and attaching them to, uh, to directing them toward Myrtle um, kind of made it look like these were all directed to Myrtle, but they were really directed to everybody in the family. So what would Marshall have thought about all this? Well, he probably would have been humored by the whole thing because he really didn't care what people thought about him. He was, he was a man that was only interested in his own interests. He wanted to push himself and grow in areas. Um, he, you know, he, he felt that if you were really threatened by society and forced to do one thing or another, that you know you're you're just not really advancing your soul. So he didn't he would not have probably cared what they thought about him. Um, and so so it comes down to what's what is the legacy of Marshall South? And first of all, you you need to look at his writings. His writings, you know, he was one that really opened up the desert to a whole uh, community of people that read Desert Magazine. He certainly promoted the desert in nature. And in the same way that many of our early desert writers, uh, Jay Smeet and Chase, Charles Loomis, uh, George Wharton James, John Van Dyke and Mary Austin. So he certainly fits in that category. Um, he's, his writings today about the desert are just as relevant as they were over 60 years ago. And you know his wisdom about the desert does continue to inspire. So I just kind of like to end this way, just kind of uh, before I ask you, uh, see if there's any questions about Marshall uh, and remind you that if you are interested in the Mar Marshall South and the Ghost Mountain Chronicles, which contain all of his Desert Magazine articles, it contains Tanya's poetry that was published in the Desert, um, in the Desert Magazine. And it has two other sections in it. There's my historical research on the family. And then there is the, um, bio that, that writer wrote and his remembrances of living on Ghost Mountain. So if you really want to know more about the family, you know, I certainly encourage you to get that book. And if you want to know about some of his writings and uh, fun readings and some of his artwork, the Marshall South Rides, again, is a great book. And of course, it's, it's free with the purchase of uh, the Marshall South book. So with, um, with that, I, I would like to uh, stop and see if anybody has any uh, questions that they would like to ask me. Uh, somebody wants to know, is he buried in the Julian Cemetery? Yes, he is. And that's an interesting story too, because for years and years, there was a trail uh, past the graveyards that everybody walked on. And in working with uh, the historians, uh, the historian in Julian, who uh, takes um, kind of studies who's in, who's parked in the graveyard there, uh, and looking at some of the letters of where supposedly Marshall was buried, we discovered that the trail people had been walking on was right on top of Marshall South's grave. And so when we did that, and after the uh, book came out, we had a special ceremony and the South family came, uh, the large extended family by that time, and we had a ceremony and we put a gravestone on Marshall South's grave. So indeed now you can go to the Julian Cemetery and you can find Marshall South's um, a place where he is buried. Uh, someone's asking, South's home was within a state park. Apparently that was allowed. Often when governmental parks are created, existing populations are asked slash required to leave. What happened here? Uh, well, in Marshall South homesteaded, that was not part of Anzabrego State Park. In fact, Marshall was a big proponent of protecting the lands, and he actually worked with those conservationists that wanted to bring that area into the park. It was homesteaded. The title was in his name. 
And when uh, the divorce occurred, the property went to Tanya. And then years later, the Anza Borrego Foundation approached Tanya and she sold the property and it became part of the state park. So when you hike up there now to, uh, to see Ghost Mountain, you are very much in Anza Borrego Desert State Park. And Marshall would have approved because he wanted to see that area conserved. Where did they live in Utah? Uh, I, I think it's uh, St. George area, I believe. Um, I th you, you can, uh, there's the articles that he wrote in Desert Magazine if you want to get more details, because he did write a little bit about it in their journey there and their journey back. What's the park's current attitude towards preserving the existing site slash structures? Well, the, the site for Marshall South's house deteriorated um, after uh, right uh, after Marshall moved out, when uh, a couple of Marines who were up there hiking uh, broke into the house and, and pulled down some of the wood from the roof for a fire. And once that happened and nobody restored it because the park uh, did not uh, at that point in time do anything about restoring the torn roof it continued to fall apart quite rapidly, but it was, the structure had stood for several years um, while it was still in Marshall's name until the break-in, until the roof was partially torn down. Uh, Marshall was very, very upset when he went back one time because he found people had broken the door, taken the padlock off, taken things out of his house. He depended on his camera for pictures when he wrote articles for Desert Magazine, somebody had stolen his camera and some other things. And then after he passed away, then uh, conti people continued to take souvenirs home. And, and as it, as it uh, slowly melted away, um, Marshall would have approved, uh, believe it or not, because he did write an article uh, about the Sentinax uh, at Sentinac Marsh up on the house where um, uh, the Sentinax brothers had lived. And he, he kind of uh, sir, talked about, you know, how how this house had melted away in time, just like you know history moves on. And he was kind of talking about himself and kind of envisioning what would happen to Ghost Mountain. So he probably would have felt okay about it turning back into the desert. And the park has never cleaned it up because it's a historical structure. And there's so much interest in Marshall South these days and people hiking up there. So they can uh, continue to watch it disintegrating and melting back into the desert. Oh, we've got so many questions. How many more do you want to take? Uh, well, let's say we got, you know, we can take a couple more, sure. Um, are any of Marshall South's children still alive and supportive of his legacy? Uh, yes, well, there were three children. Uh, the uh, the oldest writer had uh, two sons and they have families. Uh, Rudyard had a couple of children, different children, and they also have a, a large family. And then Victoria had uh, five children. What, and one of her uh, daughters uh, lives here in San Diego and is married to a um, a geographer, geologist, uh, professor at uh, Grossmont College, and he teaches there. And she was, uh, the daughter was actually many, many years ago named best teacher of San Diego County one year. So uh, they're very active in the community and they have a child who was, is, uh, would be Marshall South's great, great grandchild and who is uh, continuing. They're all take interest in their family history every once in a while, they do hike up there. Uh, they do have uh, some uh, paintings that they have and artifacts. Uh, and so the family is, is very aware of, of the history. The only one that uh, particularly wants to disassociate himself with the family would be Rudyard. And Rudyard is not his name, but that's the name um, that he wants us to use because he really doesn't want people knowing his new name. He had changed his name uh, when he went to college, uh, right after high school, and he just did not want to be associated with it because he was very close to his mother, Tanya. Tanya lived with him toward the end, uh, where he lived up in the state of Washington, still does, and he, um, he just kind of felt that he just did not want to be 
part of that history and he has remained that way, though his children are interested and did come to the uh, ceremony that we had in placing the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the marker, the grave marker for, for Marshall South. So, there's, um, so there, there are quite a, quite a few children uh, from Tanya and Marshall's uh, uh, three, three children. Um, Got another one? Okay. There's there's a lot of questions. I'm almost thinking you might want to do a follow up video at some point. There's so many questions here. Okay, well, um, pick pick one. We'll do one more. Pick, pick one more. Oh gosh, yeah. can you go through a day a typical day living on Ghost Mountain? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, they were nudists. And they would get up in the morning and, you know, if it were cold, they throw blankets on themselves, but basically they would go outside. And um, if, if, it's, if the kid, when the kids were small, they had school. So they had a table and they had to do a uh, certain work that was prescribed uh, through homeschooling from the Julian school district. And by the way, they were tested and all of the kids performed way above grade level uh, because they, uh, Tanya worked closely with them, re read lots of books uh, to them. They did not play games up there because there's lots of rocks and cacti that are up there. So when they had moved to Point Loma, they had never really played ball and never really had uh, those kind of social games that children grow up with. So their activity would have been out there picking firewood so the kids could go out and pick firewood, but they were told they couldn't pick up any firewood if they could see the house because Marshall wanted the house to always look as natural as possible with the desert surrounding. So they had to wait until they hiked far enough away that they couldn't see the house to pick up firewood to bring back to the house. So they would collect daily, they would collect firewood. Um, if it was spring, they would collect uh, whatever native plants that they could uh, they would have their school work. Uh, Marshall would take lots of hikes. Uh, as the children got older, the whole family would hike around Blair Valley and discover new things. They discovered a lot of Indian sites and then Marshall would write about them. But uh, basically they, they did a lot of reading. They, bought, they brought lots of books uh, from the Julian Library. They were all uh, well-read uh, magazines, anything they could, they would, practice uh, doing some artwork. Um, and then they would spend a lot of time uh, cooking and processing foods. Food was pretty bland. They would uh, have uh, grains that they would cook into a porridge or make like a tortilla type thing. It was, it was basically a vegetarian diet um, with, you know, if you ask Ryder, he'd say onions and carrots and grain and gruel. And, uh, you know, not, not much meat because uh, Marshall had hung up his gun and wasn't going to hunt, though every once in a while a neighbor would come by and bring them a side of beef or something, which they would make jerky out of and hang up and they would eat that. But, um, and then he would also, um, as he went into town to, uh, to mail his article and pick up his uh, check monthly from, from uh, a desert magazine, he would shop and uh, buy what was on sale. So, you know, he would buy maybe uh, a lug of apples or oranges or almonds. And so they had a cellar and they would bring some of the provisions down to the cellar and keep them down there. So basically a very, very vegetarian diet. Uh, Ryder said that one, that uh, for him, the big thing about getting out of the desert was to be able to take a shower. And he said he would stay under the, he got, he bought the largest water heater he could, and he would stay into the shower whenever he showered until all the hot water ran out, because that was one of his pleasures in life, because he remembered how dirty they were and how cold, and he loved the hot water, and he stayed a vegetarian all his life, so he never ate meat at all his entire life. Uh, the others, the others did, uh, and Ryder, um, was very close, was very close to his father. And, you know, he was very pained by the whole process of what, what had happened with the divorce and all. But as far as the daily activity, it was quiet. They had a lot of time to reflect. They did, they read a lot. They collected things they needed, always daily going out for firewood as needed. Uh, there's some fun photos. You'll see them in the book of when it snowed out there. The kids would run out and play in the snow. They make snow cones. Uh, out of them and just just had a lot of fun. They would make uh, 
toys out of walnuts and make little sailboats and sail them in little pools of water. If there was enough water, they would uh, uh, play in the water as they could. Um, so they had a they had a, a, an interesting life. Uh, it was kind of limited on what they could do because uh, they couldn't really play with a lot of toys that kids do play with. Um, but they had also a lot of things that they received in the mail because people were concerned about the children. So they got lots of presents and, and, and uh, games that they could play with. Okay, well, um, I could go on and on and uh, would be happy to do a follow-up and maybe even tell you a little bit more about um, Myrtle Botts and her background and the relationship with the family, maybe in, a, in another spotlight at some point. But I'm, I'm sure glad you joined us and learned about Marshall South. And uh, please go up there and take a look. It's a mile hike from the trailhead to go all the way uh, up to the top. Um, just, you know, take a slow and easy. It's really fun to visit. If you go beyond the house, you will find a kiln where they actually um, bake their, uh, their pottery. And if you go a little further, you'll find an area of clay, which is where they got the clay uh, to uh, make the pots. You will see Indian sites up there because uh, the early Indians uh, had gone up there to process uh, foods because you can see slicks and grinding rocks that are in the area. Views great from Ghost Mountain. Uh, they would regularly hike. They'd hike down to Agua Caliente and back up. So they were very strong hikers, very healthy, very, they ate very healthy foods, no sweets, all natural foods. So um, kind of a fun story. Um, to know about them. And um, what I can tell you is I learned a lot more after the publication of this book, because when the book came out, I had asked writer, do I, do I have enough? And he said, yes. And then later, as years went on and he began to trust me more and he got older, he passed a lot of things to me, a lot of artifacts, a lot of letters. I, I got a ton of letters that he and Tanya wrote back and forth after the divorce. She was always complaining she hadn't had enough money. He would say, I send every dime I have to you. I'm just living on water and bread basically, you know, because uh, I'm trying to, you know, help out where I can. So they wrote back and forth. I've, so I've got various letters from different people, writer letters with uh, Peter Pest when he was at Folsom Prison. Uh, uh, Pester was in trying to encourage him to move to Latin America where they can continue living in their lifestyle and not be pestered by other people uh, curious about their lifestyle. But um, there's, there's a lot more to the story and, and um, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, you know, as Anza Brego has so many stories and so many homesteaders, um, it's just one of the fascinating stories about our desert area. And thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And if you're interested, you know, uh, check out the website, uh, give us a call, uh, you know, take advantage of the discount we have for the book. And thank you very much again for joining us for this spotlight. It's been fun. Thanks. <laughs>